Okay. Okay. It won't work with me. Can show you. <laughs> Every time I try to use this kind of stuff, it, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody. Um, first, thanks, Jim, to inviting us to demonstrate or at least speak about what we've done uh, in our company, um, which is more exploration. So we're going to talk a bit more about that. Uh, so what we are going to present uh, is something we've done with Xavier Air. Is something we call yeah uh, scalable genomics data processing um, and interoperable, interoperable systems with Adam and Spark. Adam has been introduced uh, by Frank just before. So see, it doesn't work. <laughs> no, just kidding. Okay. Um, so the lineup. Um, so we are going to talk something. We lot we had a lot of reading, alignments, variant coding, and so on. So we arrived just after that, where when everything has been done, the hard parts have been done, we come just right after. We are going to talk more about machine learning on top of these data, rather than just processing them. Yeah, not just, just because we didn't cause, because this is the hard part. So we first uh, introduced ourselves, of course. Uh, then a bit more about the context of the, of the, um, of the way we've done. Then the real part what we have done, um, some results, good results, and finally, what, what we have on our bench. So Metascal is a small company that we are about to create, it's not there yet. Uh, actually, we are both consultants for now, and uh, for me, I'm Andy Nutsap on Twitter. I've created something called the Spark Notebook, which is m something more or less like IPython, uh, but fully ported to Scala and uh, distributed, actually, and it worked with, uh, with Spark Meloni. I'm a DevOps for Kids organizer for Who Know Of. Uh, I'm a mathematician, computer scientist, and uh, I've worked a lot with scalable systems and machine learning. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Xavier. I, I actually had uh, quite a career in the academia uh, for 10 years. I started with uh, PhD in physics then. Uh, is the interest into data processing uh, that arose from that time. I went into genomics and I had the opportunity to work in Uppsala, uh, where I met uh, some of you actually. And uh, then I shifted towards uh, industry, start my, uh, my own project uh, onto distributed uh, systems. And now we're uh, <coughs> joining forces and uh, putting some efforts into, uh, into research in genomics trying to develop some services to that uh, Okay, thanks. So what we do, uh, so we mainly, as I did, as I said, we do consultancy in distributed computing. So we have some projects in, in IoT, in finance, geospatial, uh, and marketing. But we are also s trainers and, and coach in Scala, Spark, and all distributed, st distributed stuffs. So if someone has why Spark, they have already the answer. Um, our domain of research and development, as Xavier said, is mainly in genomics and health, but mainly on the distributed machine learning uh, models and concepts rather than in the processing pipeline itself by itself. Our product already, as I mentioned, the Spark Notebook and a, an embryo, if I might, uh, I might say, of a GA for GH, so the, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health Server. So, okay, a bit about the talk now. So we are going to talk about distributed machine learning on genotypes data. Okay, so we are consultants. We are going to create a private company. We don't have the original data, so we have to, we had to find some data. And by chance, there is this 1000 Genomes project, right? Uh, what, is, what it provides, it's a bunch of genotypes plus the sample population that were labeling this, uh, this uh, genotypes data. So that means that we have quite a lot of data at, at our disposal. And then we can do some real uh, scalability tests because we are mainly focusing on this uh, problem, the scalability. <coughs> Sorry. So 
And this is the, second, the first part. The, the second part is the machine learning stuff that we are going to do on this data. And we, have, we had at that time three, three main tracks that you, we wanted to follow. The first was genotype, genotype inferences. The second is population classification with using supervised learning. And the last one, the one that we followed finally, is un unsupervised learning uh, for population stratification. OK. Um, a brief reintroduction to the era where, where we are working and what we used. Uh, first, we focusing, we're focusing on open source uh, projects and products only. So that's why we, we were using uh, Spark and Scala. Um, but for the infrastructure, we end up using EC2 and S3. EC2 for the processing part, S3 for the storage. Uh, we also use HDFS for the, the distributed file system in our C2 cluster, uh, Spark for the beefed up MapReduce map site. We, we also try to escape from the IOPS problem. So by mainly using uh, Tacon as a support of the Spark itself. So Tacon, I try to give some words about, about it after. And <coughs> for the scaling, scaling part in HA, we also use Mesos and Marathon. Mesos and Marathon are um, for one part of the, of the stack containing Spark, and the other one is, uh, is a tool that can run um, Spark, uh, sorry, Mesos jobs continually, keep, keeping them alive. OK, the bad ass. The bad ass stack uh, for Berkeley Data Analytics stack. So this is actually uh, what is developed in the, in the Frank's uh, department. Uh, Adam is not there yet. Should, at some point in time, right? <laughs> so yeah, so in this stack, what we are going to use for, for this talk is mainly Spark, MLlib, which is the machine learning library on top of Spark, Tacken for the distributed in-memory file system, I might say. Um, HDFS, of course, uh, we, we haven't used Mesos yet in this particular project. We are used to it. And Adam, which is not there yet. OK, so <coughs> the tool that we were using for the whole thingy is the Spark Notebook. So the Spark Notebook is mainly a, just a web interface, an IPython-like interface, where you have blocks where you can put some Scala code. Right, and it binds to it binds to a Spark notebook, uh, Spark sorry, context behind the C, and it launches all the jobs and reports the information and the and the and the, um, and the results. You guy. So we decided to, uh, to process distributed uh, genomic data. Uh, as uh, Andy said, we have the 1,000 genomes data. But is it really distributed? Um, if you make some uh, simple statistics on the data set from uh, one of the earlier releases, you have uh, 1,000 samples, as expected. And it's quite a number of uh, genotypes. The files are actually stored as VCF that are compressed, and you have 150 uh, gigabytes. You can download them from different sources, FTP, S3, nice. But the, this format is not easily uh, parallelized. It's not partitioned, and it gets even worse because it's compressed. So when you want to process this data in a distributed environment, you have to go through a, a single hole that takes you hours to get the data into your distributed environment. So we decided that we had to do the work of partitioning this data. And that's why we converted the, the 1,000 genome release uh, into ADAM format. And we store that uh, on S3. And you see that you already get a reduction in size of the data. Uh, we started from the, the VCF, not the binary format, but still we have some, uh, some improvement there uh, with the parquet comp and the, the compression. Uh, in total, we had uh, about 9,000 uh, partitions on disk, and each partition is 7 uh, megabytes. <coughs> uh, this data is available from a, a public 
uh, bucket. So if you want to play with that, uh, it's, uh, it's possible. Uh, there's another project that aims at distributing uh, such data set. It's the Ego uh, project, which is also developed uh, in the AMPAP from the BD Genomics uh, uh, group. It's currently in development, but uh, I guess soon there will be some, uh, some data sets. Uh, it's a kind of warning uh, sign here. Uh, I think we're kind of scientists, but the aim here is not to, to provide uh, really strict scientific um, results. It's more about technology uh, evaluation, see if it's possible to do stuff with this Adam Spark environment and so on. Okay. So we start from this, the thousand geno uh, genomes uh, data. We have genotypes and we have the, the population labels. And what we can do is cluster the samples and compare this cluster with the real uh, samples population. That's really naive. We are not trying to, uh, to construct a new system or a strict system to, to make uh, uh, population clustering. Uh, so we run actually simple stratification uh, clustering algorithm, which is the k-means implemented in the mllib uh, library of, uh, of Spark. Okay, and we'll see if, if that does the job, actually. Okay, so the k-means, for those who are not familiar with it, uh, the principle is that it's, it's an iterative algorithm that takes a number of centroids, so you have a number of uh, data points, that's the samples, they live in a space, and uh, the space is actually uh, described by the vector of uh, genotypes for the, the given sample, so it's a really high-dimensional uh, space. And in this space, you define a metric, so you're able to compute a distance between the different sample, and you will try to group together the samples that are close to each other. So in our case, for example, here we try to get a tree uh, cluster. Uh, so we select three centroids at random. We take the samples that are closest to each of these three uh, centroids and we group them together. Then we make a new iteration, computing the new centroid, which is the average position uh, of uh, each group until we get some conversions, right? Um, so we use these k-means. We're dealing with genotype data, and I heard that uh, genes are inherited. So to describe a population, the, uh, population you would expect to use something more hierarchical, right? Uh, the k-means is not hierarchical, so we have to flatten this thing. So we decided to, to select only three populations to avoid running into kind of difficult interpretation uh, problems, right? The second uh, uh, sacrifice we made is that we use the Breeze library, which is under the MLLib library. And the Breeze library is providing actually the linear algebra for the, the MLLib. And uh, it implements actually the Euclidean metric. So if you look at the, the representation of distance between the different uh, genotypes, we have here, uh, I would say uh, a right angle, 90 degrees angle that we cannot get rid of. So the, the distance between the, the, the most distant uh, genotypes is the square root of two instead of two, but okay, we'll leave with that, right? So what is the procedure we follow? Uh, so we work with uh, EC2. Uh, with Spark, and uh, a good thing with Spark is that it provides actually out of the box a script to launch clusters on EC2. It's that simple. Well, not that simple. I've removed here the different options that you have to, to select, but the idea is there. You launch a command from your, your, computer, your computer, and you get the cluster you want with the driver, which is the machine that is actually uh, taking the commands, which is distributing tasks to the different workers doing the job on the cluster. And it's also the, the machine that collects the results from the, from the workers. 
Okay, we made some tests actually. What you will see is, uh, has been working on the two workers and the 20 workers, and we selected flavors with uh, 15 gigabytes and uh, four cores. Okay. It takes a bit of time to get that up, uh, but that's okay. It's a couple of, of minutes, depending on the size of the cluster you want to play with. Okay, so we have a cluster. We then have to install a couple of things, very few actually. The only component that is not uh, on the cluster that we used is the Spark notebook. Uh, and this Spark notebook is installed on the cluster. It's a web interface where you have boxes. You type code into these boxes and the instructions get into the Spark driver and if required, trigger some work on the on the, the, the workers, okay? And this Spark notebook does actually two things. It configures the way the Spark is working, memory allocation and things like that, and it controls the computation, as I said. So you input code and you get your results in the browser. Okay. So the first thing we do when we have the setup working is to read the data that was converted into uh, Adam into the S3 repo. And this is done really in parallel. If you have many workers with many cores, you can read, of course, many partitions at the same time. And we saw really a, a good performance at it and good scalability, as you'll see in a minute. Only the samples population, which is a very small file, was actually read directly into the driver. It doesn't really cost, and it's a central point to get this data uh, into the cluster. Okay. We did a little of uh, data uh, cleaning, of course. Uh, first thing is that we didn't want to process the entire uh, genome, so we selected uh, a sample. Actually, we processed chromosome 22 in its entirety, because it's the smallest one, so we get the result faster. Uh, and we selected, as I said, three populations. Then from this data, we removed actually the variants for which we had missing uh, data. So we don't have to deal with inference of genotypes at, uh, at this stage. Anyway, it's very few uh, variants that are removed with this uh, procedure. So it doesn't hurt. Then we have to transform the data. Uh, the Adam uh, API, when it reads the genotypes, is giving you actually a flat structure where you have a kind of huge collection and each item in the collection is a, a genotype, which means it's a variant with its chromosome, its position on the chromosome, it's a sample ID, and it's the alleles of the, the genotypes. And then we have to transform this data into something that can be processed by the MLlib library, okay? And this is done by a number of transformations that are represented this way, but tomorrow, if you come at the, the tutorial, you will see what, what kind of code does actually the, the job, okay? And so in the end, what we want is a, a collection of samples, uh, and each sample uh, will give you, of course, the ID of the sample and the vector containing each genotype represented by the, the zero, one, or, or two. The thing that is important, of course, is that each of these vectors must be ordered consistently, so we need to keep uh, a vector of the variance in a, in a predefined order because we will measure distance between those vectors we shouldn't have uh, the variants shuffled from one to the next, okay. And then we train the k-means, a couple of iterations, then for instance, and we ask for three clusters, and uh, we get our representation of different uh, clusters. And from then, we can compare with the original populations. So this is a run that you get typically from uh, 100,000 uh, variants, which is about one-fifth of the chromosome, I, I think. And um, you compute, we have here actually the, uh, the confusion table, which means that 
uh, we take here the, the cluster labels that were trained and we compare the number of items in each cluster with the number of items in the original population and we see that the procedure actually reconstructs the actual population pretty well. I will not try to interpret uh, these errors, but it shows that it roughly works. Okay. And this actually shows that uh, you can get results out, out of this, uh, of this uh, framework and, uh, and maybe it could be worth considering then uh, implementing more genetic uh, related algorithms to do the, the stuff well, right? In terms of uh, performance, we tried this on, on the two node clusters and 20 node clusters and then locked the, the time. Uh, cluster launch, well, it takes some time, as I, as I said. And then in terms of, you know, just reading the, the data from the S3 and uh, dumping it into the HDFS of the cluster or reading from the cluster, you get something that is pretty uh, linear with the number of nodes. There is a, a little catch here. We don't have a, a, a 10 times factor because as was mentioned just before, you have to take care of the number of tasks that you ask to uh, to a single core because uh, here we have only, uh, we have 80 cores, but you have only 114 partitions, which means that after one bunch is processed, you have uh, only 34 partitions still to be uh, processed, right? While you would like to have uh, 80. Okay, so, so we have a factor 1.5 that we lose here from a, a bad design or it's a lazy design, let's say. <laughs> okay. So in terms of uh, training the data, we have similar results. You see that you get a really high performance uh, improvement with uh, larger clusters. And we tried also the, the processing uh, on the complete uh, chromosome as well, where of course the, uh, the amount of time uh, increases as expected, but not in a dramatic way. Okay. So that's pretty much for it for the yeah. for the training of the clustering. Yeah. Okay. Um, could you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was for for the analysis that we've done on the on the data. Uh, one cool thing that hasn't that much mentioned is that so k-means is an iterative algorithm. So this is why Spark worked that well, actually. Uh, the code we will, you will see tomorrow, but the code is for the entire project is less than 100 lines. I mean, and we had to deal with this iterative processes that the data load unload in memory. But thanks to Spark, we didn't have to do much because it's Spark by itself that does that. Okay, besides that, um, what we have right now in Madat Scale uh, on the bench, so on what we are currently working on, is a uh, compliance server um, respecting the laws induced by, um, by GA4GH. GH. Um, so what it is? Um, who knows about this project, this global alliance here? Yeah, quite a few. Okay, so those guys are there to define the, the language of, of genomics data sharing, let's say. It's like the W3C in, uh, in internet or for who knows the OGC in geospatial data. So what they are defining for now is to two sides, um, two folds, sorry. So there is the model that represents the data by itself, which is, by the way, uh, in, uh, modeled in Avro, thanks to Frank and Matt, actually, <laughs> more or less, let's say. <coughs> sorry. Um, and there are the methods. And the methods are concentrating on the, on the search, um, to search call set, variants, references, and so on in the data set that are underneath the service. Um, so the defined schemas, as I said, uh, in Avro, so it's fully typed, it's, um, it's well-defined as well, it's shareable, it's part of the protocol. 
um, so clients can be built up just looking at the, at the schema. And, um, and the storage is for your side. It's, it can be doing parquet like in Adam or whatever that comply. Um, yeah. So what is um, mainly? So we have a bunch of models and methods. So methods are services and models are reads, variation references, um, common of course, which is shared across. Um, and the methods are there for reads, uh, variants, but also core set. And um, I can remember the fourth one. And Beacon is there just to say, okay, I'm, 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 I want to share my data with you. Is more or less what it says. It's just a service that says, if you, if you are willing to share your data. So Google is on the, <laughs> is is on this track. So they have already implemented um, most of them, if not all of them. So. Uh, they are respecting the 0.5.1 uh, version of uh, this API. As you see, it's very new. 0.5 is very, very new. Uh, but they are very there. I mean, they are participating in our discussions. They are pushing hard on that. So um, since they are very big and they are very strong, they already implemented all of them, actually. So if you go to the appliance test, the compliant test, you can plug in their API, and you will see that the 160, uh, um, sorry, uh, 17 method have been implemented passing the tests, <clears throat> and this is great. Actually, this is very important. We are when we are entering the interoperable world that we have this kind of test because these are uh, the tests that are they are saying, okay, these two person will be able to share data and and to to work together without any uh, hassle. So we are currently implementing this. So we started one month or so ago. And uh, so we are structuring the application for now. So this is more or less the, the, the rough uh, the row, um, architecture diagram. So it's a play framework web server for who knows. It's a Scala reactive um, web server. Um, where you, we have the web layer, so the play server, and we have a bunch of microservices, one for each method. Okay, so we will have one of those uh, microservices behind it. And we can either expose the data through the REST API or the Avro RPC API. So, because we dislike JSON so much, Okay, we had we had it this over RPC um, uh, REST not REST API, but because REST is al always confusing people with JSON. No, this is another RPC call which is fully binary, fully binary uh, condensed, yeah, respecting the Avro schema. So it's typed. Um, we have the data access um, part, which can read either Adam, Hadoop, Bam, whatever. Then we have also the Spark, the Spark side of it because we had to compute. We have to do a lot of machine learning of these data, of course. And we have on the on the backhand side we have the data sources, which we call data layer, the data sources API. Uh, besides the cache taken, and there we have finally the the legacy uh, distribution of the files or whatever. So the Taken, so um, a few words about it. Um, Taken is something that can hold a very huge amount of data in memory, okay? And it also has its own line edge. So if you lose a partition, it will be able to recover it uh, um, by itself. So it doesn't have to, to rerun a, a, um, a process. If he loses a, a, a partition, he's, he's going to be able to do it on, your, uh, on his own. So the project is on the hit, GitHub for now. It's open source, so all PRs are more than welcome. Just contact us if you want to enter or have uh, some uh, entry, um, entry point. We are uh, very willing to help. So uh, just to s show a bit of, our, of the, the, the project, so we have uh, different uh, methods. So each of these is a microservice. And you have the routes that, that defines the entry points. And the entry points is something like this. So we have a pause, variant search, and then the controller. This is for the REST API. Behind the C, we are just using the Avro RPC uh, popping up into a, 
a, uh, a single uh, port anyway. So this is how it's, it is defined. Okay, this is, we are just reaching the end of the talk. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Jim, for inviting us. Um, uh, Berkeley for the project and supporting us uh, on uh, several topics. Clodera also for working uh, uh, with us on the Ego project. And hey, come back tomorrow. We are going to give a longer talk about what we have done, showing more code and um, and so on. So, and uh, in the afternoon with Frank, we will be uh, very happy to give a a to 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 yeah to give an icon where we can hack on the code directly. No questions. Yes. 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 <laughs> So how, how important they are? How important will they be? Uh, will they be? So but I, actually, it's, it's really great that you, you, you mentioned Hadou, um, Mahout, for instance, because Mahout is going to port all these algor its algorithms to, to Spark, for instance. So at some point in time, you can use Mahout uh, to, to, to uh, run your uh, machine learning algorithms on Spark because they are refusing all MapReduce jobs for the moment. So Ted Dunning has said no, no more, no more MapReduce jobs there. Uh, machine, uh, the, the MLlib library is very growing fast. So if you go to the roadmap page, they did uh, about to support plenty of different new algorithms. I know a very, a lot of universities pushing hard to implement the new uh, models on Spark rather than on whatever. Uh, besides secret learn, of course, because uh, they always support secret learn for small stuff, so let's say. Um, for graph, there is GraphX. GraphX is very great. I use it a lot and it's very efficient. Um, so how they will be, how important they will be, I cannot really tell actually, but <laughs> maybe Frank could. Um, <laughs> They are in different colors, actually. Yeah, they have the this is the slide of Hadoop, you will see the same thing. Yeah. Different, and then instead of Hadoop, yeah. they put a spark there. So, uh, yeah. So just to be sure, so, so 
the gray, the gray part are not part of the BDIS, they're not developed, developed by the BDS. So again, maybe Frank can tell more about it. But Hadoop MR can be run on Mesos, okay? Spark is not using Hadoop MR by itself, right? So they are, they are using MapReduce stuff, but not the implementation that comes with Hadoop, right? So they're not really integrated with Spark. Spark, Spark is based, is part of the, the BDIS. So Hadoop can be run on Mesos, and Mesos is something like Yarn, okay? Let's say, in, in, roughly, okay? So it's just like a cluster management that have been there to, to, to get rid of this blue, blue whale in Twitter, at Twitter. You know, remember this blue whale? <laughs> tweet, boom, a blue whale. Ah, oh, we cannot tweet, okay? This has been, uh, uh, we cannot, we, they, they could get rid of this well thanks to Mesos because it's a very uh, good cluster management uh, system. So since Yarn is also a cluster management system that can run uh, applications, we can put Spark on top of it. That's more or less it. They're competing in the same world. But there is an implementation of Mesos, uh, Mesos on top of a yarn or the, inver the reverse? I can remember. eBay did that. It's, it's yarn. Yeah, but there is an implementation of one on top of the other now. I think, yeah, I think yarn, yarn has been implemented as a... It, 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 it's it's yarn on Mesos. Yeah. yeah. So they implemented a Mesos scheduler for yarn. So yarn can run on top of, of Mesos right now as, a, as a, an application. My, my view of this thing is... Uh, they're all part of the same open source ecosystem that has compatible APIs, uh, whichever way you go. And then uh, it's up to the user to decide what is most convenient to them. Free eggs. <laughs> but uh, so, so I, I wouldn't say, I'll, I'll do both uh, at the same time, on the same day, in the same pipeline. We do both, actually. We have Yarn and we have Methos at some point, because Yarn is very good for, let's say, because we're using Samza as well in our project, IoT project, and we have Samza on Yarn because it's very good, and we have Mesos for our uh, small services, uh, Mesos for, yeah, for our small services and, and Spark, actually. Okay, <laughs> okay you may leave to the panel. Thanks. Mm. Thanks, guys, yeah. Mesos Yarn, I'm on Yarn. 